Hi, I'm David Ashton. In this presentation, I'm going to be presenting research and examples relating to the performance of Mozart's concerto for clarinet in an 18th century style. Let's begin with a little background on this piece. This was Mozart's very last concerto. It was premiered by his friend and collaborator, the clarinetist Anton Stadler, on October 16, 1791 in Prague, only a few months before Mozart's death on December 5th of the same year. While this piece is generally well known, if present-day listeners familiar with standard recordings of this concerto could travel back in time and hear Stadler perform this piece, they would likely notice some significant differences. The orchestra would have a much smaller string section, the whole ensemble would be tuned down to A430, and the tone of the ensemble would be warmer and darker because of this and the use of the period instruments. These time-traveling listeners might notice an odd-looking clarinet with an extended low range because the piece was written for Stadler's new basset clarinet in A, which had a range extending to low C. They might also notice Stadler playing during the exposition, right at the outset of the concerto, and also during many of the tutti sections throughout the concerto. This is rarely done today, but it was common practice at the time. Each of these differences are very interesting and noteworthy, but I argue that the element of this late 18th century performance that would most surprise a modern listener, and especially a clarinetist familiar with the concerto, would be the extensive embellishments to the written notation that Anton Stadler would have improvised. The evidence shows that Stadler would most likely have taken liberties to alter what was written on the page throughout each movement. It is not certain in what exact manner or precisely how much and when Stadler would have added to or altered the notes and rhythms that Mozart wrote for him, but it is fairly certain that every performance of this concerto would have been played a little differently. Luckily, there are several relevant late 18th century resources that not only support the practice of embellishment, but which can give us a good idea of how musicians like Stadler might have approached it. In 1789, when Mozart had likely already begun writing this concerto, Daniel Gottlieb Turk, composer, keyboardist, pedagogue, and contemporary of Mozart, published his treatise Klavierschule, in which he writes, I regard any attempt to prove the necessity of ornamentation at greater length as superfluous, since the need is so evident that none can fail to recognize it, especially in the light of present taste, ornaments have become a very necessary requirement. For one knows by experience that many excellent compositions lose much and perhaps have only half the effect when they are played without ornamentation. On the contrary, a very mediocre work can be extraordinarily improved by well-chosen ornaments. The difference between the autograph and published versions of the piano works that Mozart originally wrote for himself are another convincing source of evidence supporting this practice. Robert Levin, renowned pianist and major contributor to the revival of the improvisational language of Mozart's time, explains the reason for the differences in these scores. Essential to the idiomatic performance of 18th century music is the addition of decoration to the notated text. This was normally improvised anew at each performance by professional musicians. Amateurs required assistance in such matters. Hence, the printed editions of Mozart's piano sonatas contain both more dynamic indications and more decorations than the autographs. Specific examples of this will be shown further on. Levin explains the reason for improvising these embellishments rather than writing them out, and it wasn't just about Mozart saving time. He writes, Mozart was above all a dramatist. His performances were crowned by his improvisations and dependent upon the spontaneous realization of a musical surface he often left somewhat bare. This allowed him the necessary freedom to slant the characterization of a given performance in a particular direction. A close look at the concertos that Mozart wrote for other instruments shows that he didn't trust all other performers equally. As will be shown later on, some of these concertos are quite finished and leave little room for embellishment. The question to consider now is whether or not Mozart left room for and expected improvised embellishments from Stadler specifically. The evidence confirms that Stadler certainly had the ability to improvise embellishments. He, like many professional instrumentalists of his day, was an able composer as well as performer. Ten different collections of pieces have survived of which he was the author, as well as references to five or six more works now lost, including a concerto. In fact, Stadler is also the earliest known composer to write for unaccompanied clarinet. It is true that there are few references to Stadler's improvisational ability, but this is likely because this practice of personalized elaboration was commonplace among professional musicians. Also, Stadler was often referred to as a virtuoso, and in the 18th century, that term implied a level of ability that included skills in musical elaboration and improvisation. Perhaps the best evidence of Stadler's ability to improvise and Mozart's expectation that he do so is that little or no elaboration is written for the soloist in all the places where a soloist would typically be expected to embellish or extemporize. The same is not true in several concertos written for soloists that Mozart didn't particularly like or trust. These finished concertos are a valuable resource that we will be considering later on. There are many places in concertos where embellishment would be expected, and 18th century authors wrote in detail about this. 
While I have examined many treatises of the 18th century, throughout this presentation, I will give the final word to Turk's Klavierschule because of the fact that he published it so close to the premiere of Mozart's Kleine Concerto. Regarding what can be embellished, he says, it may generally be observed that only those places should be varied, but only when the composition is repeated, which would otherwise not be interesting enough and consequently become tedious. It is customary now and then to vary a passage at the repetition of an allegro and the like. However, longer elaborations are most frequently used in compositions of a gentle, pleasing character in a slow tempo, and particularly in an adagio. On the subject of when to embellish, Levin states that, there are generic places where embellishment is most likely to be desirable. The most salient of these is the return of the principal theme in sonatas and especially rondos. Mozart's Kleine Concerto is an excellent vehicle for learning to improvise ornamentation and other embellishments because it has abundant unaltered repeated material in the Allegro, which is in sonata form, as well as in the Adagio, basically a da capo aria, and of course in the recurring themes of the rondo. However, we need to be careful because Mozart provides some built-in variation already. The clarinet exposition in the Allegro is quite different from the orchestral exposition in that the soloist has embellished versions of the melody and even sometimes plays an obbligato or accompanimental figures while the orchestra has the melody. However, it seems that he didn't bother quite as much in the other two movements, which allow for even more personalization in the repeated material. Still, there is abundant room for alteration in the first movement. Mozart often writes only the skeleton of the melodies, as it were, for himself and other soloists. Mozart wrote out some of the embellishments he was certain he wanted as a minimum, but left room for Stahler to add his own. In regard to the small-scale view of when or when not to embellish, Levin advises us that the amount of ornamentation required from the performer depends upon the ornateness of the melody. At times, the amount of elaboration in the original text precludes additional ornamentation. Levin also mentions several instances in which embellishment or filling out is appropriate and even necessary. For example, Whenever melodic and rhythmic activities suddenly slacken without obvious dramatic or expressive motivation, such as during sequences and slow movements and passages whose top and bottom notes are delineated without the necessary connective arpeggios required to give them their intended shape. The last description applies well to measures 214 through 218 on the clarinet concerto when there are whole notes separated by more than an octave. In her 1991 recording of this concerto, German clarinetist Sabina Meyer connected measures 216 and 217, as well as 218 and 219, with added arpeggios. With these ideas in place regarding where it may be appropriate to alter what is written on the page, the study will move on to explore this process and show concrete examples of these alterations. It is both traditional and pedagogically advantageous to begin by learning to add the essential ornaments that were still in use at the time before building upon them with more complex variations and florid embellishments that define the manner of improvised alteration in the late 18th century. Here are some very brief examples of several of the essential ornaments added to the kinds of places as recommended by the authors of the 18th century treatises on embellishment. The Pagiatura, slide the termination The trill. The mordant. <laughs> 
is also discussed within the category of miscellaneous ornaments by Turk as well. In Mozart's day, vibrato was considered ornamental, and straight tone was the default manner of singing or playing an instrument. Before going further into changing the notes and rhythms Mozart has given us, there are two more techniques for embellishment that are not ornamental. It appears that Mozart leaves the dynamics of the clarinet part entirely in the hands of the soloist. In the earliest scores, there are no dynamics specified in the clarinet part. Mozart is more specific with articulation, but still leaves much of the clarinet part unmarked once a general style has been established. Also, in this time period, a slur marking functions more like an indication of the decrescendo than it does as a specific articulation. For variety, the soloist can also choose to change articulations in repeated material. This often goes hand in hand with dynamics as demonstrated here. Another kind of embellishment that does not necessarily require added notes is described in another letter from Mozart to his father Leopold. Everyone is amazed that I can always keep strict time. What these people cannot grasp is that in tempo rubato, in an adagio, the left hand should go on playing in strict time. With them, the left hand always follows suit. This technique is very useful in slow movements, and it is very useful when adding additional notes, but it can still be used with the written notes in the adagio of Mozart's clarinet concerto. For example, any of the runs in measures 47 through 40, 54 can be delayed slightly and then played with an acceleration that temporarily disconnects from the steady eighth accompaniment. The subtle floating sensation is pleasantly dramatic as long as the runs are followed by solid resolutions on the beat. time to start altering the notation that Mozart gives us. The easiest way, as suggested by Turk and others, is to start with rhythmic alterations. Turk writes that it is also possible to vary by displacing the notes as when some are lengthened and others shortened. The necessity of changing rhythms to accommodate other methods of variation will be very evident as we move forward. The next mode of making variations is that of keeping the same number of notes but replacing some written notes with others while retaining the original rhythms. This method is particularly helpful for altering repeated fast material that leaves no room for ornamentation or added notes. Arguably, the most obvious mode of altering the written music is by adding additional notes to those already notated. This often results in rhythmic adjustments to the printed notes, but in this method, rhythmic alteration is a minor result of filling out some of the space left by the composer. At this stage of embellishment, the various methods of ornamentation and variation can begin to blend together, and when taken to the extreme, in slow movements, this evolves into the florid embellishment that will be covered in the next section. For the present, this exploration will limit the amount of added notes in order to explore several methods of filling out space without using large, sweeping virtuosic scales and patterns. I will now demonstrate a device referred to by Mozart's father Leopold in his violin treatise as the circle. Adding prefigured ornaments and other predictable formulaic devices is manageable with guidance and practice, but adding or changing notes without these and spontaneously creating new material can be very daunting without a basic understanding of the construction of 18th century idiomatic musical lines. In this time period, a melodic line is, in the most basic sense, a series of broken chords with or without added neighboring tones between chord tones. <laughs> 
Being aware of the underlying harmonic progression is the first and most important step in the construction of any melodic line. If I remove all the non-harmonic tones from the exposition of the allegro, we are left with the following. Mozart really economizes the use of non-harmonic tones, and this melody is still completely recognizable without them. To begin the process of composing or improvising musical lines, one must first know the underlying harmony and then distinguish between the harmonic and appropriate non-harmonic tones. For example, here are the harmonic and non-harmonic tones embellishing a C major triad. <laughs> through each chord like this can train the ears and fingers to appropriately resolve non-harmonic tones and emphasize the chord tones during improvisation or composition. Once an improviser or a composer is able to embellish a single chord tone with those surrounding it, then the next step is to embellish and or connect more than one chord to make a little melodic segment. Here I will demonstrate this with two chord tones with various non-harmonic tones. Ordinary scales can accomplish this same aim, but if not used skillfully, they can end up emphasizing the non-harmonic tones more than the harmonic tones. With very short durations of notes and quick runs, this doesn't really matter as much, but when using pitches with longer durations, this can be problematic, as demonstrated in this non-example. For the purpose of demonstration, this next example has chord tones on all the strong beats, but in practice it is acceptable to have some non-harmonic tones on strong beats as long as there are not so many that it excessively obscures the intended harmony. The scale and the chord tone based approach can be blended easily because in essence they are one and the same. Scales are simply chord tones close together with only one or two notes in between them. This example demonstrates two different elaborations of the same basic chord tone only melody. The 16th note based top line is a further elaboration of the line below it. In both examples, both the chord tone method and scale approach are used. A good resource for learning how to vary repeated material is Mozart himself. As mentioned before, in some of the concerti he wrote for others with lesser improvisational skill, he personally wrote out the variations in the repeated material. For example, Mozart's Flute Concerto No. 1 in G major, as well as his Violin Concerto No. 5 in A major, are much more finished than the Clarinet Concerto, and include more written out embellishments. In this image, you can see the various occurrences of these main themes of the rondo movements of the Fifth Violin Concerto. Here you can see the same in his first concerto for flute. 
Mozart writes almost no alterations in the repetitions of the main theme of the rondo. It is highly unlikely that this is because he did not want them altered at all. Most likely he relied on Stadler to vary them himself. The following example attempts to apply Mozart's own variation techniques from the flute and violin concertos to the rondo of the clarinet concerto as if he had written the alterations for Stadler. There is a useful source for determining the additive techniques that Stadler might have used himself, and that is Stadler's own book of composed variations on themes. Here are just three measures from the first piece shown in each of its seven iterations laid out in parallel staves. examples, variations are made in the compositional style of Stadler. The next type of alteration is a natural outgrowth of the previous and is essentially taking the additive method of variation to the extreme by using longer flourishes of additional notes. This is almost exclusively done in slower tempos that allow the space necessary for such additions. This highly decorated and luxurious style of embellishment is often referred to as floored embellishment. Here we see a comparison between the skeletal and the elaborately embellished versions of Hummel's edition of the piano concerto in D minor. And now of the ployer embellishments of Mozart's piano concerto in A major. And here we have Turk's own embellished adagio from his treatise. While these each use some essential ornaments, the style is generally floored in that the decorations are complex, abundant in added pitches, often chromatic, and necessarily rapid. Upon close examination of each of these examples of floored embellishment, it is apparent that the skeletal notes, while often obscured in the flow of extemporaneous runs, are very rarely left out. Mozart certainly seems to have written the adagio of the clarinet concerto like a vocal aria, writing mostly skeletal notation and leaving ample room for embellishment. It is highly unlikely that an 18th century clarinet virtuoso with compositional ability would not have elaborated upon what was written. A more realistic question is whether these elaborations would have been floored in the same manner as Mozart, Hummel, Ployer, or Turk. The clarinet of the late 18th century would limit the performer in regard to the rapid chromatic scales often found in forward embellishment, but other than this, there is no good reason to assume Stadler would shy away from an opportunity to demonstrate his abilities. Even if Stadler did in fact take a very conservative approach with very little embellishment, it is still a worthwhile endeavor to apply floored embellishments to the adagio. This can still be done somewhat with the limitations of the clarinet of the late 18th century. And here's a related question to consider. If Mozart played the modern clarinet with its greatly improved chromatic fingering system, how would he embellish this movement? The last several examples are embellished in a way that comes across as florid overall, not because every alteration is a rapid running melismatic figure, but because these types are occasionally intermingled with other simpler methods of variation and ornamentation. What follows will be a categorization and analysis of only the embellishments most abundant in added notes from the previous examples from Hummel, Ployer, and Turk. 
Several of the florid type embellishments are using the same additive techniques and even essential ornaments previously discussed, but in longer lines with more notes of shorter durations. For example, in measure 25 of the ployer, shown here, a rapid descending scale is added starting far above the written tones, both before the E's and also before the D at the end of the measure. The E's are approached in what would be considered a battement in isolation, and the F sharp is played and then enclosed with its surrounding tones. All of these divisible events strung together are heard as one flowing virtuosic but expressive embellishment. A large portion of the plural embellishments are simply made of a chromatic scale. In measure 22, after the first C sharp, the melody is anticipated, and then the connection to the high A is made by a connecting chromatic run to an appoggiatura. The use of chromatic neighbor tones within scalar passages and arpeggios is an important element in creating the surface chromaticism that is so common in music of the late 18th century. One of many examples of this is in measure 8 of Turk's embellished adagio. The last method for making florid embellishments is the use of various complex figures that fill in consecutive intervals of the same rhythmic duration, most often a third. Hummel writes an excellent example of this as seen here. In this case, these single connective devices are essentially compound turns, but when played together, they are heard as a single virtuosic event. Turk gives a brief introduction and warning before the presentation of his embellished adagio that has already been shown and analyzed. His statement is fitting for what follows. He writes, The following very simple adagio to which embellishments have been added can serve to some extent as an example of how to follow the rules which have been given. Not all of them could be applied here because several pieces of varying character would be required for this purpose. A keyboard player of refined taste would moreover not heap so many elaborations on well-written melodies as I have done here for the sake of illustration. In the following example, embellishments are added to the recapitulation of the adagio of the clarinet concerto using the various techniques already discussed. I give the same warning as Turk. This example has too many embellishments for a single performance. The purpose of using them so extensively is to demonstrate many different possibilities. Now we move to those few instances in Mozart's clarinet concerto that are fully improvised with little or no underlying melody indicated. In the same chapter on extemporaneous embellishment, in which Turk discusses cadenzi, or embellished cadences as he calls them, he also writes about other opportunities for the soloist to improvise freely when the meter and accompaniment temporarily halt. He sees these as separate from the more harmonically complex and potentially virtuosic cadenzi that usually appear at the end of a movement. He distinguishes between these two varieties by referring to the less complex type simply as the embellishment of fermatas. Turk summarizes his approach in three overarching rules. Every embellishment must suit the character of the composition. Therefore, it would be most unsuitable if in an adagio of sorrowful or similar character one would add on a merry passage to embellish the fermata. The embellishment, to be exact, should be based on only the prescribed harmony. However, passing tones are an exception to this. One should avoid modulations to other keys. <laughs> 
The embellishment should not be too long. Nevertheless, one is not bound as far as the meter is concerned. In the same chapter, Turk includes many examples to demonstrate the types of fermatas that can be elaborated upon, as well as to demonstrate the length and content of embellishment in different tempos and rhythmic feels. Here's his first example. These two pairs of fermatas in the first movement of the clarinet concerto are very similar to the examples of embellished fermatas written by Turk. In this example, the fermatas are embellished following the guidelines established by Turk. <laughs> In the next occurrence of this pair of fermatas later in a different key, the fermatas are embellished as suggested by Levin using thematic material and shapes from different parts of the concerto. The first uses the main theme, and the second version borrows a shape from the rondo. <laughs> The fermata most in need of elaboration is found in measure 59 of the second movement, right before the recapitulation. After this lone fermata on the dotted half note B-flat, the next indicated pitch occurs as the clarinet awkwardly begins the restatement of the main theme of minor seventh lower on the C. To simply hold this fermata without extemporizing a melodic line leading down to the C would be very unmusical, yet this is all the Mozart wrote for Stadler. This fermata is replaced in some modern editions by a line found in measures 49 through 50 of the Larghetto from Mozart's Clarinet Quintet, which conveniently shares the same key and time signature and which begins on and leads to the same notes. Mozart coined this type of fermata an Eingang, or a lead-in, because of the way the soloist guides the orchestra back in. An Eingang typically occurs on a dominant chord preceding an arrival of the main theme or a move to a closely related key. Like a regular embellished fermata, an eingong is usually performed in a single breath, otherwise its dramatic effect is diminished. We know that Mozart expected vocal soloists to improvise eingong in this place of many fermatas in his operatic arias because he ended up writing some out for soloists who needed some help. Mozart also left room for eingong in most of his concerti. Here we see a close-up of the original score of his fifth violin concerto with nothing but a fermata, and also a modern version with an eingong that is typically played. This leads into another iteration of the primary theme of the rondo, as is a common use of an eingong. The same principles that Turk outlines for other embellished fermatas apply to the eingong. This example of an eingong for the 59th measure of the second movement of the clarinet concerto is based off of a reoccurring melody first heard in measure 17 of the same movement. <laughs> And this second mimics the running passage in measures 294 through 296 from the yet to be heard rondo. This last version imitates the main theme of the Allegro. 
embellishment of the fermata at measure 59, a pause is inserted because of the octave between this last note of the embellishment and the first note of the returning main theme. The pause in this case may lessen its leading function, and it may not technically be an eingang, but it still works. In the same spirit, it is also possible to make an eingang work in the place of the previously explored fermata at measure 315 in the first movement, because in this instance the soloist begins the following canon. This discussion regarding the embellishment of fermatas concludes this brief look at the various means of variation beyond the essential ornaments. If there was a place for a lengthy traditional cadenza in this concerto, it would be necessary to consider the means of applying these same skills to a more complex chord progression weaving its way from the tonic 6-4 to the dominant, but since there is no such place in this composition, we will conclude here. The intention of this discussion is not then to diminish the accomplishments and traditions of modern performers interpreting classical music in a 19th or 20th century style, nor has it advocated the abandonment of the modern clarinet when playing music from the classical era. However, while respectfully acknowledging and embracing the contributions of the great musicians and educators who have interpreted this music without the application of historical improvisational and embellishment techniques, the historical evidence has clearly shown that something significant has been left behind. Thankfully, the missing elements that make playing this music so enjoyable and which can bring it to life for the listeners are not lost forever. The effort it takes to learn to personalize or finish this composition as Stadler would have done is well worth it. Sufficient resources are available, consistent and intentional application of these carefully preserved musical principles will enable a musician to perform soloistic music from this era with the same kind of mastery, energy, and spontaneity that Mozart and many of his peers like Stadler possessed.